Hello and welcome to Spy Hard Podcast. My name is Agent Scott and we are continuing our deep dive into 2024's The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. And we've got a special treat lined up for you today. I'm actually sitting down with the writer of the book the film is based upon, Mr. Damien Lewis. Damien is a British author and filmmaker who has spent over 20 years reporting and writing about conflict zones in many countries, uh, and he's written a ton of books as well, namely the book that we're sort of focusing on this week, which you'll know as the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. It was released as Churchill's Secret Warriors, the explosive true story of the Special Forces Desperados of World War II. So without further ado, let's get to the interview. Joining us on the show now, we've been talking about this film all week, and let's get to the man who brought the book together in the first place. He is a journalist and an author and a filmmaker, and he put together the book that this film is based on, The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. It is none other than Mr. Damien Lewis. Hello, sir. Welcome to the show. Hello. Great to be with you. Uh, Wonderful to be here, sir. And uh, it's I've got a lot to talk about when it comes to ungentlemanly warfare. We love a spy movie here. It's what we do best. And it, it's just, it's nice to see a spy movie um, come about with a sense of fun nowadays. They all seem to have a little bit of the, the dire streak to them post sort of, sort of the Born era onwards. And there's a real sense of camaraderie and, and fun about ungentlemanly warfare, which, you know, I, I, I just finished the book as well. And I think it all comes from, the, the relationships that they all shared going back to some of their, the, the earliest missions on, on Fernando Po. But what I want to get into is it will take us back to the beginning of the book and how that book came to you before we get to maybe the film and all the machinations there. So um, one thing that the book says is it comes from sort of the declassified stories of uh, you know books from Winston Churchill. You'd already written some books by this point, um, but uh, you've been a journalist years before that. How did you stumble upon the stories of March Phillips and Lassen? Yeah, so um, I was approached by a guy who was a former SAS guy, um, uh, a, 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 a gentleman in his latter years of life, but you know he'd, he'd served in the regiment, and he basically said that um, he'd read some of my books and he felt there was a story that needed telling that hadn't been told. Mm-hmm. And it was the story of Anders Lassen and his band of warriors in the Second World War. And uh, crucially, he had um, he had you know the contacts and access to around about half a dozen um, veterans of the Second World War from this unit. So he said, you know, I can get you access to these individuals and all the research material. So you know, I kind of started looking into it and talking to to, to, to individuals. And you know, the story hits you like a like a speeding truck head on. It's so absolutely fantastically amazing. If you made it up. If you made up all the crazy, mad, unbelievable, unthinkable things they do in this in in this book and in the Second World War, in in truth, these things all happened. And you put it forward as a Hollywood movie script, people would say, "No, no, 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 that couldn't have happened." Well, it all did. So very quickly, I thought, "Yeah, this is an incredible story." Um, one of the really sad things about it is that um, you know today, as we speak, there is only one veteran of that unit left alive. He's a guy called Jack Mann. He's become a good friend of mine. Uh, he's in his late 90s, and that is the only one left with us. So, you know, capturing these stories whilst these guys are still alive is is becoming less and less possible. And was he uh, was he part of uh, like the SBS or something like that? Was he involved in any of those towards the yeah. end of the missions? Yeah. So Jack um, Jack Mann was actually in several different units. So he was in the Long Range Desert Group, who were the Desert Reconnaissance Specialists. Then he was in the SCS and the Special Boat Service, the SBS, and he was also in the Phantoms, which were a secret signals unit so he had an incredibly diverse and um you know fascinating war and and and, and full of boundless courage of course he was also soe special operations executive ministry of ungenerally warfare because all these guys at the very early stages and the kind of stages that uh, we're talking about with operation postmaster in the movie mm-hmm. they were all soe agents so they were you know these deniable black operators the very first of their kind it's a it's kind of a crazy story to think about it and put it into context because spies and espionage has, ex- has existed for a very long time 
pre the wars or the the world wars but for it to come into sort of a military service in a sense and having a military service of intelligence that seems to be maybe the first in the world the, the soe and just to think that that was where it all began in many ways is is, is utterly crazy and the fact that also that a lot of this just wasn't known yeah yeah i mean these operations were extremely sensitive and and you know beyond top secret i mean you know the, these operations have really never been written about because for that very simple reason i mean several people actually did try to write about them after the war people who'd been on some of these operations and they were told to know in certain terms they weren't allowed to and, so, and of course the mm-hmm. files were closed as well so those files that hadn't been destroyed because sadly an awful lot of soe ministry of Ungentleman warfare files were destroyed after the second world war something like 85 percent of them were just burnt and, and got rid of um but those files that survive are really really useful but of course they're only opened in the in in very recent years you know they're closed under the 70 year rule or the 80 year rule or the 100 year rule or the 150 year rule you know there's any number of of ways to skin a cat and so you know getting one's hands on those files and getting to speak to some of the guys who served in the unit was absolutely crucial couldn't have told the story otherwise well, it wasn't a question I had planned, but you, you've led me on to it. Did you find there were barriers to getting to some of these stories? Were you obfuscated by certain departments in, in, in the military? Do you know, it's a really interesting question because it's, it's quite funny in a way. So if you imagine it, there there is a committee at the National Archives mm-hmm. that have to consider freedom of info, information requests to get files open that are still closed. So if there's a file under the 100-year rule, whatever it might be, you can ask for it to be opened. The point about it is nobody who sits on that committee was alive at the time the file was closed. And so the reasoning behind the, the closure of that file for such a long period of time generally escapes people. And so generally, you do. I've only had one file ever refused to be opened, and that file was refused to be opened because, you know, the... the it was basically it had intelligence ramifications and i think there were still family members of the intelligent purple person still alive so there was mm. sensitivity so sometimes you get files opened and they're partially redacted so parts have been just blacked out but it's only once have i ever not had a file opened so you know one is blessed by the fact that with the passage of time there's really no one left left around anymore who can actually remember or mm. cast their mind back or have reference to why it was so sensitive at the time and why it remained closed did you uh, did you find that to be a bit of a barrier to putting the book together in a sense i mean you were given a lot of the information and the contacts you made throughout sort of the sas and and, and the other services were i imagine key and you say at the beginning of the book this is pieced together from different sources and you tried your best to make a facsimile of the best versions of what happened in each story but you know was that a, a particular trouble in bringing that together and trying to make a cohesive uh, sort of narrative out of all of these journal entries it, it's always a challenge with um you know historical um you know historical books you know second world war or, or even more recent actually you know and the other thing about it is it, it just is a fact that no two people who've been on the front line of war behind enemy lines will remember those events the same it just that is just how it is you read the accounts and they they differ people's mm-hmm. memories differ you know it's a very emotional time very stressful time high octane roller coaster existence you know very few people kept diaries those who did you know the, the diaries that were kept are very rare and very precious so you do have different versions of events and you know the the, the technique that i use to try to to sift that material and come to the to the core of the truth, the core of the narrative is the most likely scenario. So if you've got two or three sources which kind of corroborate each other, you go with that. Um, and that's all. That's the best you can do. I mean, you have to take a view as a as a writer and a historian or someone who brings history alive and, and tell the story to the best of your abilities. Well, I mean, before we even get to talking about the film, I think the book is is genuinely wonderful. It was, a, I mean, I, I've picked up a copy physically, but I was in a, a mode where I think audiobooks were certain, doing it more for me at the time. And I think I went through the 12 hour unabridged version in about three days, which is uh, a lot of my day gone for that. And I, I, I think it's a real page turn. I recommend people pick up a copy of the book before even watching the film, because the film itself is only the first hundred pages or so, I'd say. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So so the film only covers Operation Postmaster, which is really the first mission in the book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the same characters go on to carry out a string of equally unbelievable, unthinkable, daring, 
maverick, crazy, wild operations. They really are some of the best best stories in the Second World War. And the idea always was, from the very get-go, that it would be a series of movies, mm-hmm. which is why at the end, of course, Churchill says, you know, now you work for me. He's got his band of, you know, covert operators, and he sends them off to do other uh, missions of daring do, which is exactly what happened in, in truth. I mean, Churchill really did embrace these kinds of operations. Without him, they'd never have happened. And he had a very hands-on, very personal interest in them. Well, you're queuing up a question I think I'm going to pin for later because I want to get more into the film. But I think getting back to the book itself, and you mentioned when you first heard about some of these stories and you felt impassioned to tell this story. And there's a, there's a phrase that's used throughout the book, the, the piratical nature of these soldiers. I, I just like that phrase, piratical nature, piratical nature. But what is it about their missions that just it captured your imagination? Well, it's a different way of waging war. No one had ever done it before. And, and what, what, I, what I love about it, you know, cutting to the quick, and let's be frank about it, what those guys who joined these units loved about soldiering in them was it was a completely different way of operating. That's, that's why they were so unpopular. Mm. Let's get it straight. They were deeply, deeply, deeply unpopular. Most people in high command, the military high command and in political establishment abhorred what these individuals, what these groups were about. And they didn't like them because it was ungentlemanly warfare. It wasn't the way British officers were supposed to behave. This wasn't the done thing. It wasn't cricket. And of course, Churchill had 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 vowed, you know, set the ends of lands of the enemy ablaze. You know, um, leave the trail of corpses in your wake. Make sure no German soldier can sleep soundly in his bed at night. That's what he asked his men to do, and he asked them to do the unthinkable. So he was a believer, but most people weren't. And if you read the accounts of those who served in these units, it's fascinating. The only discipline that was required in the these SOE units or the SAS as they went on to become or the SPS was self-discipline mm. you know the, the idea of you know uh, officers ruling the roost by rank alone and and strict rigid, rigid hierarchies was anathema these were egalitarian units where people from all walks of life didn't matter if you were a dustman or a plumber or a lord or you know a, a, a high-born um member of the aristocracy it did not matter you were all equal in these units and you all crucially were encouraged to put forward your ideas in in a chinese parliament a gathering of equals no matter how crazy and off the wall they might seem because those were exactly the ideas they wanted because if they were if they were utterly utterly unthinkable ways of hitting the enemy of course the enemy would never think of them because they were unthinkable and then it was the ethos to put those ideas into operation so if you can imagine being in a unit like that where you're empowered you are it, discipline is self-discipline. The only threat against you is return to unit. If you step out of line, you'll be returned to where you came from. No, that's the worst thing any of them can never conceive is to be thrown out of the brotherhood. You know, you're told that no matter what your rank, you know, if you're a small unit of, of, of operators behind enemy lines and everyone else is killed or captured, you, Private Smith, will go ahead and carry out the mission because you have the ability to do so. So you're completely empowered and you feel like this brotherhood of equals, you know. Um, and that was a wonderful thing for so many of these individuals. It was that's why the esprit de corps was so strong. That's why the brotherhood, the spirit, you know, the sense of, of teamwork and camaraderie was was second to none. And you can see that when you read the accounts from the time that, you know, th- that's why they were willing to go and undertake suicidal missions, which, you know, on paper, Operation Postmaster was a suicide mission that the chance of pulling it off were pretty much zero and if you got captured you knew you were going to be hung out to dry by your government denied by your government you're in you're in civilian clothes you're not in uniform therefore you're treated as spy by the enemy and therefore you get tortured and killed in a very nasty way that's what you know is coming so if you can imagine volunteering because they're all volunteers to do those kind of missions imagine what kind of you know what kind of impetus you need amongst the, the brother warriors and, and sister warriors, because some of them are women that you're serving with. It's absolutely extraordinary. And that's what it all boils down to. And that's why they're such great stories. And that's why they're so unique and groundbreaking and so compelling. I mean, you mentioned the word camaraderie, and that was really something that jumped out to me when sort of going through the stories. You know, you could see these people were willing to jump in front of bullets for one another. And that is not something you would see in the rank and file then, at least anyway. Uh, maybe it's a different story now in the armed services. But, uh, and, you know, you talk about desertion in, in the Axis forces when they're, you know, in, in southern Italy and places like that, in the islands. And a lot of that happened there too. And, you know, I. It, 
there's a story that just jumps out to me when you're talking about that sort of sense of um, interdependency within the unit and a, a sense of other as well from the rest of the armed forces. A, a story really late in the book where there's two of the soldiers, I can't remember their names, I'm sorry about that, that are asked by a separate major to dig in on in the beach. <laughs> and they go, why? This is completely pointless. And the, the major is like bristling that they're not doing what they're told. And then Lassen comes over and says, why on earth would they do that? And then just takes them away, which is just uh, completely at the antithesis of what you think would happen in an armed service. But it's exactly why they were so successful. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the scene's a brilliant scene in the book. So they've actually, they're already on this island and there's no, there's no enemy on the island. It's been an unopposed landing. And then, and then a, gr a bunch of regular forces come storm ashore from a landing craft, you know, bayonets at the ready almost. <laughs> And they're kind of lying down, brewing up, as, as they do on the beach. And the major storms over and says, why aren't you digging in? And they say, we don't do that. And he says, what, what unit are you from? And, and, and how, why are you dressed so appallingly? You, you know, he's, he's apoplectic. And they're like, you know, uh, well, we don't dig in, so we're not digging in. And actually, it, it gets to the stage where the major calls over, you know, some of his men to put them under close arrest. And they say, no, yeah. no, you're not going to do that. And they, it's pretty much guns, gun, you know, guns drawn. And then... Lassen comes over and he says, what are you doing? And the Major says, well, I've ordered your men to dig in. He said, we don't dig in. He says, who are you? He said, I'm Major Anders Lassen. And he's, of course, he's, he's you know, he's got, he's highly decorated already by then. So mm -hmm. he, you know, the, the, the Majors look at him. He, okay. He looks like, like, they look like a ragtag bunch of pirates. Because bear in mind, uniform was personal choice. Mm -hmm. You could pretty much wear any kind of items of uniform you fancied. Um, and but but despite that, you know, the fact that they look distinctly piratical, uh, Lassen and his men are highly decorated. And Lassen says to the Major, my men have seen more war than you would ever even understand. I'm paraphrasing. Sure. And they're more highly decorated than anyone in, 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 in your entire unit. And he introduces them. This is so-and-so with, you know, with, with, and he lists their medals. And he says, we've got better things to do and just takes them away. And it's as they're walking away, <laughs> one says to the other, Lassen's, you know, marching off in front, and one says to the other, "Do you know? Sometimes you've just got to love that man." <laughs> and, you, and you do, the, you, you do. do, you do love Anders Lassen by the yeah. end of the book. Yeah. And I mean, a fascinating story in his own. And I, and I think, you know, we're slowly pivoting towards the film and, and, and sort of the characterizations in there. But one thing I wanted to ask you, because Operation Postmaster is what the film revolves around, but there are many more operations that you talk about in the book that they undertook, and more, I imagine, that didn't make the cut. Yeah. To the book as well but of their exploits during world war ii what was sort of your favorite story to read well my favorite story in the book um it's probably when they liberate santorini <laughs> so the, 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 basically lassen and his band of you know a few score warriors are tasked to liberate greece i mean it's completely insane but anyway they are because the Allies can't spare any forces. And so mm -hmm. they, they they liberate Athens. And then Lassen, on his own accord, no orders at all, just says, well, I'm going to go off and liberate Santorini, which is which is Greece's second city. And there's like a 2,000-strong German garrison there. So he turns up at Santorini, having just sailed up the coast in some kind of like commandeered fishing boats. They've got one jeep and like, you know a few dozen men. And he gets in the jeep and drives it all around the high ground around Santorini so it can be seen a lot. And then he sends a message via via you know a, a courier to the german commander saying and events are completely fictitious british corps you know thousands and thousands of troops says, i'm the commander of this this the so-and-so corps and what i have you surrounded and you know uh, these are the you know these these are the uh, men at arms i have under my command and if you don't if you don't surrender or leave santorini immediately you will be annihilated mm -hmm. and doesn't get a response so he then thinks right we've got to up the ante so they go to the fire at fire station and they get the fire engines <laughs> yeah from the town and so they drive into in from the outskirts into in towards the center ringing the bells and setting light to houses and you know just making it look let's look and sound like this is major advance taking place then he sends a few of his men in on these kind of like 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 probing patrols and there are some blistering firefights which they win and eventually the bluff works and and the german commander basically says give me 24 hours and we'll leave and they they do so Lassen's bluff pays off, and then they take Santorini, Greece's second city, and Lassen becomes the governor of the city for the next week. And basically, they party like there's no tomorrow, and, and, and you know they deserved it. And 
eventually he receives an order from someone in high command saying, you, you know, you shouldn't be there. How did you get there? And when are you coming? When are you going to return? You know, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's priceless. It's absolutely priceless. That's one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite operations, but, but yeah, that there are so many brilliant, brilliant raids um, in the book. And, and, and there is just so many delicious, you know, moments of high drama that, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's a feast really. It's some of the stories in the book feel like they're entirely fictional. Yeah. Like these, like these things just couldn't have ever happened because they're so out, uh, outrageous. Like the, the Santorini mission is a prime example. It's yeah. Anders Lassen and a handful of men riding around on, on fire trucks, making yeah. a lot of noise. And then the, the, the Nazis acquiesce and then they, they, they give up and, and, and hightail it out of there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it, it's just like, that that just feels like it's prime for adaptation to film. And that's kind of where I want to pivot us into because the book comes out and then I think it's about a year later that Paramount Pictures get involved. Is that about the sort of timeline I have? Yeah, I mean, it was actually a couple of, um, well, well, I mean, it's a chap called Neil, Le- uh, Neil Perrett, who's a, a producer. It's a great story, actually. He just happened to read the, read the book as soon as it came out. He's mm-hmm. playing, it's in the States, he's playing football with... Um, He's an English guy. He's playing football with some, 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 you know, fellow people in the film industry. They've got a kind of football team in LA, and he just said to two of them, "Hey, guys, read this book. It's amazing." Two guys called um, Paul Tamasay and Eric Johnson, who are you know really great scriptwriters in Hollywood, and they read it and said, "We've got to make this. We've got to make this movie." And so they took it to Brookheimer Films, and Brookheimer Films optioned it, and then they took it to Paramount. So you know that all happened over about a year, um, and you know the great thing about it was that from the get go, you know. Um, Jerry Brookheim, but in particular Chad Oman, who's the um, the producer there, the guy you know produced Pirates of the Caribbean and loads of other amazing stuff. Mm-hmm. He basically said from from the from the very off, you know, look, Damien, we're going to make a movie that you're going to be proud of. You know, that is what we're going to do, and I promise you that. So you know, watch this space because it's coming. So you know, that was always the intention, and it was always the intention, incidentally, to make several a, a series bringing about the same characters based around Anders Lassen. You know, as it becomes more and more kind of to the fore. Um, and that's why it's just Postmaster, you know, in the first mm. movie. Yeah, that, that was a, a query I had. And so Paramount, uh, Brookheimer's here. What are they pitching you in terms of, of a story? Is it meant to, is it like a men on a mission story or are they looking to make it more dramatic? How how are they originally sort of pitching their adaptation to you? Because obviously it goes through, I imagine it's gone through several uh, sort of evolutions over the time before when it was yeah. first purchased, to, you know, Guy Ritchie turning up. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was always the idea was always to make a a movie or series series of movies looking at the very earliest birth of black ops. That was that was that was the log line, if you like. You know, where did it mm-hmm. begin? Because from here, everything else flowed. All the stuff that we accept today as being normal and you know just part of our everyday landscape, like you know black black deniable operations, secret units, you know, all this kind of stuff. It wasn't always that way. And in Second World World War, this was utterly revolutionary. Mm. Um, and, you know, it was always the intention to get that story out there so we would understand the heritage and where it all came from. And, you know, we'll get into the eventual casting. But did when you were putting the, the book together, I, I imagine you had images in your head, images of the real people, of course. But did you ever think about it being turned into a film? Did you ever have any idea of who you perhaps want to play, you know, March Phillips and Lass and, and some of the other characters? Yeah, I didn't to the degree that I would, you know, um, think about casting but because i was a i was a war reporter for um you know 30 years or so and i i mainly was a a cameraman so i filmed my own material so i've got a very visual way of seeing and and writing and perceiving stories i mean i i see them in my head as i write and people who read my books say it's like you know it it feels like you're immersed in in a movie almost when you're reading them so Mm -hmm. i think i've got a very visual way of bringing stories alive so yeah i can see it kind of playing out in that way um and, and i think whenever i you know whether it be second world war or even more contemporary whenever i'm writing something there's always a part of me thinking how would this look how would it how would it appear on screen because that's that's the world i came from um so yeah i you know it, it was always to me a you know you've got this this group of characters who you just couldn't write them if they, you know, you couldn't invent them if they weren't real. You know, truth is strange in the fiction, mm-hmm. and this, and, and in this book, book it it really was and is. You know, as as you said, you know, these missions, um, 
a, a number of them, if you actually propose them as kind of, you know, movies with no factual basis, people would say, come on, that's too far-fetched. That would never have worked. Like the fire engines in Santorini. The reason why it worked is because Santorini is a brilliant example. You know, the enemy just couldn't, they couldn't think in that way. You know, mm -hmm. they, the, the German military was great. We you know it was a very efficient military machine, but it was very rigid and hierarchy, hierarchical. You know, it didn't have that. They never had the same special elite forces, you know, de deniable um, operations that we had. I mean, they had, you know, they had very, very small um, units that operated occasionally, but nothing on the same level, nothing on the same level of kind of, you know, maverick, piratical, unthinkable operations. That's something, that, and I don't, I, I can't put my finger on why, but there's something about the British mentality that lends itself to it. There's something about British eccentricity. I, I you know, there just is some. There's an alchemy there. Well, it's, it's British and Irish actually, mm -hmm. crucially, because so many of, of of these guys were up were from, you know, from the Emerald Isle. And and there's something about that alchemy in the Second World War where we just perfected this way of carrying out these operations, which were so outrageous and so off the wall and so unthinkable. The enemy would never imagine that possible. So yes, they would. They'd buy it. You know, they'd buy the bluff. Yeah, I mean, it, I feel like there's just a sort of a sense of like guile and pluck for these men. They just, they just knew what they were doing would be successful, and that mentality almost manifested their success. And one thing I found, especially when I was going through the book, was the the key was in the name, ungentlemanly, because everyone thought that war was a sporting thing to do. Everyone was like a handshake and a game of cricket, and it's like. No, you can play outside the rules, you can colour outside the lines, and apparently no one else could think of that. And that's why even, I think you mentioned a book, as an MP who complains about it in Parliament. And I just think, but clearly they're being successful. Why on earth would you complain about this? Well, that's probably because MPs complain, but yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, the, the, cr the craziest thing of all was that the more successful they became, the less popular they became. Because sure. if you think about it, if you've been schooled in the First World War, trench static trench warfare, mm -hmm. as most of our commanders had been, uh, who were you know senior commands in the Second World War, and if you had been schooled in that kind of you know idea of gentlemanly officer conduct, and then these guys come along and start doing what they're doing, you know hit and run operations behind enemy lines, you know shoot and scoot, um, you know. Uh, doing the utterly unthinkable and 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 not adhering to the traditional rigid hierarchies mm -hmm. all of that is anathema to you so you know it's going to get you back up and it really did you know, they were deeply unpopular but then lo and behold it turns out to be incredibly effective so they're not only cocking a snook at you but they're proving you wrong in the most powerful way you can imagine so the more successful they became the more unpopular they became there were so many attempts made to disband the soe and sas during the war it beggars belief i mean you know and they have they earned all these epithets like raiders of the thug variety or the ministry of ungentlemanly warfare or mm -hmm. or the baker street irregulars or the firm or the racket that's those were the nicknames that their detractors gave them and in, in typical style, they just embraced them and made it their own. But they were hugely unpopular because they were proving the 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 naysayers, the stick in the mud. You could argue there was a different way of doing things, and it goes it goes back to Churchill to a large extent because Churchill, and the very word go, that's why he fu he fu he founded the Special Operations Executive. That's why he founded the Ministry of Gentlemanly Warfare right at the start of the war mm -hmm. because he said Hitler has has declared total war. This will be a war waged on all fronts and all levels. We have to do the same. In fact, we have to do better than him. We have to go further. So the Ministry on Gentlemanly Warfare was literally set up to do the, all the things you are, strictly speaking, not allowed to do under the rules of war. So it was bribery, assassination, corruption, money laundering, uh, running guerrilla armies, smuggling fleets. Just if you think... If you conceive of something crazy, the SOE might have done, it will have done it. I'll just give you an example. By, by the end of the war, and it's going to sound absolutely insane, but it's true. By the end of the war, right, the SOE was making so much money from all its nefarious activities. It was making a profit. So it was a self-financing intelligence and black ops organization, right? And it got upbraided by, by Parliament because they said you have to cook the books. You have to... 
you have to, you know, you have to do some false accounting because it's embarrassing how much money you're making. And they did. Now, you can get your head around that. It's just, <laughs> it's absolutely wonderful. And, you know, that they, they ran this operation off the coast of Spain, just as one example. Mm -hmm. And it's, when I stumbled upon the files in the National Archives, I thought, no, come on, this can't be true. It's absolutely true. They called it Musson's Smuggling Fleet. So what they did, the Royal Navy was blockading much of Europe, right? So they were confiscating, you know, cigarettes and alcohol and all that, you know, all, all, all the stuff they didn't want getting into Nazi-occupied Europe. And so the SOE were taking the contraband that had been confiscated off the off the bad smugglers, mm -hmm. right? But they had their own pet smuggling fleet. These are bona fide Spanish and Portuguese smugglers, right? So they're giving the contraband to them, saying, well, you are allowed to smuggle it. You will not get stopped. All we expect you to do is run guns and ammo to our uh, guerrilla armies and resistance fighters behind the lines and run agents in and out for us and bring us intelligence. And so th it reached the stage where they didn't, they couldn't get enough contraband from, from what the Royal Navy confiscated off the bad smugglers. So they set up cigarette manufacturing plants in, 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 in Portugal and Gibraltar to provide cigarettes they'd manufactured to the smugglers for their smuggling fleet to smuggle into enemy occupied territory to, to run their um to run their intelligence gathering operation, their agents insertions. And that, that's just one example. And it, you know, it, it's just and it's called Musson Smuggling Fleet after the surname of the English guy, uh, you know, Captain Musson, as he was at the time, who was the skipper of the fleet. But it's a true story. And it's just one of it was one of its countless operations they did. And it, it earned a handsome profit. It's stuff like that that you can understand why the top brass in the military were were had their having their feathers ruffled, perhaps because it was just like, how are we not able to do this? Why can't we have this sort of fun? And they're out there being pirates, which to them sounds like a lot of fun, which is actually a, a very hard job to do. Reading the accounts of the uh, of the book, one thing we haven't really touched on is the espionage side of things. We talk about spy movies here all the time. We're getting into the behind the scenes of the movie, but one thing the book points out and the film dives into a little bit more and probably a little bit of a lie in that sense is is the ian fleming connection to all of this yes. mm -hmm. and one thing you talk about in the book is, is ian fleming taking some of his inspiration for james bond from march phillips and from lassen mm -hmm. um the film portrays ian fleming actually has him as a character in the film for a few scenes not too much there's some other films recently that have a, had a ton of ian fleming for some reason um and i just was sort of curious from your side of things what do you think Ian Fleming, I mean, I mean, what was his extent of his involvement with all of this in reality? And what do you think he actually took from these stories and, and put into the character of Bond? So Fleming was the um, immediate boss of the op postmaster team. So the maid honor force, you know, mm -hmm. SSRF, SOE, whatever you want to call them. He was their immediate boss at the Admiralty. So he tasked them with their operations. And he'd come to, you know, March Phillips on several occasions before with really, really cracking ideas for operations and every single time they'd been stymied by high command and sat mm -hmm. on and torpedoed and eventually that of course they got op operation postmaster through because churchill backs it so fleming basically um james bond is a photo fit and he's a photo fit of several individuals one of them is march phillips um another is a guy called wilfred biffy dunderdale who was the mi6 uh intelligence chief in paris and to this day, he's a legendary figure in British intelligence circles. Um, and Dunderdale, you know, he had to have it all. The champagne, the fantastic clothes, the long cigarette holder. Dunderdale, Biffy, by the way, because he was great with his fists. He was a great boxer. Uh, but, you know, son of a shipping magnate, very high born. Um, and, and Fleming also worked closely with, with Dunderdale throughout the war, war as well. So he kind of pulled together these various characters and that became Bond. Bond was kind of a mishmash of two or three. Um, and then the missions that, that Bond undertakes in the early books, they are based upon genuine SOE operations. But obviously Fleming could never have written about them, you know, as, as truth because mm -hmm. they were top secret at the time. So, you know, he did the next best, best thing. And, you know, thank God he did and how successful he was. He turned them into cracking fiction stories. And But the inspiration behind them are, are true stories. It, it it does make you genuinely wonder to to what level some of these missions were then because I obviously some are are, are very strange like Moonraker and, and such but some are far more grounded even stuff like Diamonds Are Forever and 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 Casino Royale you could definitely Casino see Royale. Exactly. yeah exactly. 
that could definitely have happened. It, it does yeah. not seem anywhere like uh, it is a fictional story. So yeah, I could totally buy that. And and you can see, especially from sort of the the leadership qualities of Lassen and March Phillips, where that sort of leading man quality about Bond comes from, and and the confidence in himself sort of comes from there. I would have thought. Yeah. Yeah. Well, getting back to the film, right about 2015 or so, Paramount, Bruckheimer will get involved. It's not until 2021 that Guy Ritchie is announced as the director. Uh, I was curious, and so was my co-host, uh, what was sort of the the cause of sort of the lead time between those two things? What, what was happening in those six years? Obviously, the COVID at one point. COVID, uh, scripting. It went through various script iterations. Um, and And then... It was it was a question that you know Guy Ritchie brought with him, you know, simplifying as much as I can, a great access to 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 to, to the cast. You know, mm -hmm. those guys, Cavill in particular, Henry Cavill in particular, but some of the other guys as well. They they've worked with him, you know, on on several great movies, and and and, and so they they kind of come as a package, if you like. So getting Guy on board meant that you could you could access that great talent, and that's that's one of the key things that kind of came came to the fore. Um, you know, and, and Alan Richson, you know, hot on the heels of the brilliant portrayal of uh, Reacher, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the child adaption. Uh, he was the kind of, I know he's not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're going to say. <laughs> physically, and as Lassen, but in spirit, he's a great Lassen, in my view. I mean, I, I remember when I met Alan Richson first off um, on the set of HMS Belfast mm. and in London where they're filming the, the, um, some of the maritime scenes and and you know so Alan Richardson's I don't know six foot four probably and, and and about as wide as that horizontally massive guy and um and I'm five foot six so I was gazing up at him thinking yeah um not quite not quite Anders Lassen speak <laughs> so I said to him I said you know what's it been like playing Anders Lassen who's um you know uh kind of six foot if that and whip it slim and um you know speaks um, English with a strong Danish accent, and he and he laughed and he said, "Well, you know, I speak English like I'm a German." He said, "That's the best accent I can do." Mm. And he said, um, "And of course, you know, I'm twice his size, but all that matters is that I'm damn good with a bow and arrow." And I was like, "Yeah, okay, fair enough." And he proved it on 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 the screen. So, um, so yeah, it, it really it was bringing those kind of you know key players in, in into the into the mix, which made the movie kind of viable, if that makes sense. I think it does, and I think the casting, especially of March Phillips and Lassen, is is spot on what I would have pictured from reading the book and listening to it. And, and you know, you speak of uh, Richardson being slightly larger. I think Lassen feels, despite him actually being quite a, a whip thin guy, he does in in sort of the story sound like he is just this huge mountain of a man. Like he fills the room with his personality. So Richardson is, is almost the right choice anyway. Yeah, yeah. Lassen was a a towering figure. There are only three statues of um, uh, SAS individuals at, at Hereford, the SAS base. One is David Sterling, the guy who founded the SAS. Mm -hmm. The other is Paddy Main, who went on command command the SAS during the war. And the third is Anders Lassen. So he's the only member of the British SAS. He was Danish, but he was serving in the British SAS ever to win the Victoria Cross. No one else has done it. So he's a absolutely legendary figure and you can see when you read the book you know his men would have followed followed him anywhere they worshipped him and he worshipped then it went both ways you know that that that's that was the camaraderie and yeah you're absolutely right i mean do you remember that scene where he he knocks out jellico the commander of the sbs just punches him for mm -hmm. almost no reason in the bar knocks him out and jellico's like well i can't discipline him i can't court martial him because he's too valuable i mean yeah. the men will follow him anywhere so he just goes lets him off lassen was a force of nature i mean you know, I I almost use the 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 the, um, the phrase about less than the good psychopath because I think psychopathy is a spectrum, like like many of these things, mm -hmm. you know, bad psychopaths and good, and and Lassen's kind of on the good end. I mean, you know, there are those so many key moments in the book where you know Lassen, in in it's it's a standout quality about the man, and it kind of redeems him on many levels. That the amazing relationships he he develops with the local people within whom he operates like when they're on crete for example mm -hmm. you know and when he goes to s such lengths to try and stop the germans carrying out these savage brutal horrific reprise reprisals against you know cretan villagers you know he he feels this in his heart you know i mean denmark's occupied 
you know, his country has been taken over by the Nazis, so he's got that commonality. But it's more than that. He has this innate, instinctive, you know, guerrilla warfare savviness about him, which means he knows the hearts and minds of the locals is absolutely vital. And one thing I think jumps across as well is I think despite him having quite a good upbringing, which I think he tried to keep secret, but he did feel like a man of the people. And he, you, know, you, you mentioned about like Denmark being uh, you know, invaded by the Nazis and, and also he's trying to liberate you know Greece at that point. There is a, a sense of they're both going through a shared sort of uh, a shared moment there and they're, they're going through it together. So I can understand why they really sort of celebrated him and adopted him in many ways wherever he went basically all the stories seem to be that he was always invited in yeah yeah that there's that very early on there's that kind of it, so lassen was a was a you know a massive womanizer as well i mean women just loved him I mean, mm. let's just be frank about it so there's that there's that moment right early on on postmaster where he sent up country in nigeria to to work out the, the to build the charges to blow up the anchor chains for the mission and do you remember he falls in love with the, you know, the Nigerian local chief's daughter mm-hmm. and, and basically cuts a deal with the with the chief to, you know, for the dowry and he's going to marry her. And eventually, because of the mission and the way the mission, you know, gets carried out and the fact they're all arrested at the end and all the rest of it, he can't actually go ahead and, and marry his Nigerian bride and bring her home. But that's Lassen through and through. He just gets right in there, you know, with the locals and, and realises that in their kind of warfare... You know, there are only two ways you can carry out these kind of operations um, anywhere in the world. There are only two uh, environments in which you can operate. The first is somewhere like the Sahara, wide open desert. No one lives there. So you can just operate there willy nilly. OK, mm-hmm. or you have to operate in places where the locals are sympathetic to your operations and, and you know, will feed and clothe and hide you and 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 provide you with intelligence. O- only in those two situations can it work. And Lassen understood that instinctively from the get go. Yeah. For sure, and and I think you know, looking at the the film version of of this story, and it, it does go for a couple of changes. Operation Postmaster, the the Fernando Poe side of stuff, gets expanded a little bit from the reality of what happened. But you know, Guy Ritchie's on the project at this point in the in the sort of narrative we're, we're talking about here. And you mentioned going to, to HMS Belfast, you've gone to the set to talk to the people, but how involved are you at that stage? You're an exec producer on the film. Are you being brought in on scripting, uh, giving notes on that? How involved are you? Yeah, so um, I um, had some um, kind of really crazy experiences on that level. So I, I can remember <laughs> maybe a dozen times at least. So I'm so I, I I would be sat here, you know, in Dorset in my in my study writing. I get up very early to write. It's the best time in the day to do so. So I'd be six o'clock writing away. I'm I'm in some World War Two story, or maybe maybe it's Iraq in two thousand and you know two thousand and and and, and two thousand one or wherever it may be. And um, and I'd get a, a WhatsApp message pinging on my phone. It'd be Chad Oman, the producer. He'd be on, he'd be on location, and he'd say, um, oh look, we're just um. We need your input into this, these three pages of the script, a Churchill speech or what Lassen's saying here, whatever it might be. Can you just kind of make that sound like it would really sound, give it the authenticity? And I'd be like, uh, yeah, OK, uh, three pages. All right. Yeah. Uh, like, like, give me a deadline when he'd say we start shooting at nine. <laughs> OK, no <laughs> pressure there. No pressure. I'd be like, You're joking. No, no, we start shooting at nine. That happened quite or quite a regular I'd be, I got to stage. I was like, "Yeah, you need it by nine. Don't tell me. Okay, I'm on it." So <laughs> that, that was that was my my steep learning curve in terms of how they put these things together. And then, um, and the other thing that I I, I kind of um, yeah got very involved in is you know at the end of the movie they have the photos with the real yeah bios of the real individuals. So when we um, had the um, the sample screening in front of a sample audience, you know months before the final cut in London, in a Mayfair hotel, 200 audience. Um, and it's the first time I saw the movie, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and you know, um, the, the really, really fascinating thing was it actually was very powerful. After the movie, they had, like, feedback session with with that sample audience. And everybody, man, woman, you know, it doesn't matter what their age was, everybody said, oh, my God, it's a true story. I can't believe that's a true story. 
they were just blown away by it. So we then realised that we didn't have that much in there about them, actually. That's So we then realised we really had to drill down into that and get those absolutely spot on and expand them because that aspect of it really hit people. I mean, people were saying, why don't we know about this? This is amazing. It's a true story. How could we not know about this? So, um, yeah, I had quite a significant you know, in, involvement in making sure that side of it um, really kind of, you know, really worked. And, and there is actually, because I... I, I I, I um, helped the guy do it. So there's, there's a filmmaker friend of mine who who did an amazing interview with Jack Mann, the one survivor from this unit that we mentioned earlier. Um, mm-hmm. Beautifully filmed. It's documentary style, but it's beautifully filmed. It looks, you know, it, it's, it's really, really great. Anyway, um, I did say, look, let's put some of that film at the end. Let's just put a few clips of that film because it would have been great to actually hear and see one of these guys is still alive. That never made that never made the cut. But, you know, that that kind of thing... If there are sequels, I'd love to have something in there, you know, Jack speaking from, you know, one of the real guys that just makes you that's a real showstopper in my view. Well, it, it's I think I can't remember. It was about a week ago. I watched the film now. But is there a title card at the beginning saying this is based on true events? Based on true story. Yeah. Based yeah. On true events, yeah. 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 I think even at that point, a lot of people were quite sceptical because we've been lied to before as film goers, whereas it's based on a true story and it's a complete fabrication of a true story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but this is actually pretty pretty damn close to the truth. Yeah, that's um, right. And that's why you had to have those photographs and those bias at the end because yeah. it's like it just hits you, you know? Yeah. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Red alert, spy hards. We are shaking things up over on the Patreon page. That's right, we are launching an exclusive new show where we tackle the exploits of the small screen's greatest secret agents like Jack Bauer, George Smiley, and beyond. And don't forget, every month you also get two Agents in the Field episodes where we decode the adventures of your favorite spy actors in their biggest non-spy movies. But Cam, tell the people what we have coming up next. Seeing as how Scott and I are partying it up in Las Vegas at this very moment, now is a perfect time to catch up with our big July episodes. That's right, reviews of Sam Peckinpah's Cross of Iron and X2 X-Men United, as well as, of course, our coverage of the 1992 Lifetime TV movie remake of Alfred Hitchcock's Notorious. So don't get left out in the cold. Help support your favorite spy movie podcast and join the circus at patreon.com slash spyhards. But before this message self-destructs, let's get back to the spy jinx. Um, one thing that wasn't necessarily as close to the truth, now I wonder what your involvement was in this, and I mentioned that the sort of expansion of the Fernando Poe story there, and you've got, because there was an operative helping them on, on Fernando Poe, he did organise the casino night, but there wasn't two concurrent parties, a fancy dress party, a sing-along, all that sort of stuff, but that's that's more to add intrigue and more of an island-based thing to give them a location to work with and to build up the suspense in Fernando as the boat's coming, and I imagine from an story screenwriting perspective that's why that's in there but what was that an idea that came across from you or from the writing team or were you involved in sort of expanding the fernando poe side of things so that idea came from the writing team um i mean in truth there were two parties they just didn't happen at the same time do you remember mm. there was a there was a dress rehearsal they yes. realized it was going to work yes. and did the real thing mm-hmm. so so that kind of um you know actually you know uh, that that's the inspiration behind it um it, the most the most kind of outrageous and brilliant thing the SOE did on the ground, in my view, in terms of Fernando Poe, was the way they blackmailed the um, Spanish governor. Do you, do you remember that part of the book where they... Didn't they catch him in a, a, a compromising situation, like from Russia with Love Style? And, uh... they, they, they find that he's got a, a local mis- a mistress. Yeah. And they, 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 they photograph him through the window in a compromising situation. They use that to... They basically say, right, the photographs are going to go everywhere, including to your family or you... You, you you know we own you and mm-hmm. uh, you know we're going to use your your aircraft to fly over fernando po and take the photographs we need so we can carry, we can do what we're intending to do and he actually had to play along that's that's the real essence of soe that's real dark arts that they you know they 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 used and without that the chances of the mission actually succeeding would have been far far less because you needed those reconnaissance photos to plan it properly and mm-hmm. there were there were other things that they did in fernando po in terms of the soe side of it which didn't make the cut, didn't make the film, but, you know, were just that kind of intrigue and, and doing the unthinkable to the T. 
Well, there was also the story, I believe, of the the chap in that is featured in the film is also in the story, and it stays around after the mission and has to rowboat his way out of there a couple of months later. Yeah, and that uh, was I think he had a broken arm or something, a like broken hand perhaps, and yeah. like. And this is again a real story and a harrowing one at that. It doesn't make the film, but uh, they they inject drama in their own way. And yeah. one way the the film injects a bit of drama into that side of things is by having sort of an antagonist uh, in Heinrich Lure, played by Till Schweiger, uh, on the island. Um, I, I there was a, a I do remember there being a, a, a German commander. Uh, of one of the boats on the yeah. island. I'm not sure. Is that the same character? Is that the same name as the person? I may have forgotten since, or was that a completely fictionalized commander on the island? I think that that that, that guy is just a, you know a construct. Uh, yeah. There was a German commander there, and he he's the guy who actually stormed into the British embassy after the operation and tried That's to it. tried to beat up the the British consul, and the British consul actually was a it was an SOE agent, you know, uh, and, and and beat him up instead and threw him out and and got him arrested. So yeah, you know, uh, but 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 the the lure character in the movie is 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 you know someone they just felt they had to have there. Yeah. Well, you, you needed something to add some stakes to the two agents you had on Fernando Po. It makes complete sense. And I suppose I, I wanted to ask you from from that side of it because the rest of the story is pretty true to life. What were your thoughts on how they brought that bit, the Fernando Po side of it, to life? Were you happy with sort of the changes? Yeah. The only thing that I I think. Um, you know, this is from a kind of technical perspective, um, grated, but I, 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 I guess it, it kind of works, but it doesn't work technically, if you get much of mm-hmm. it. works emotionally and if it works filmically, it doesn't work technically. So, you know, when there's that moment and, and Isa Gonzalez, you know, the female SOE agent, and just just let me say, she, in my view, is brilliant. She's a, she's a showstopper. Her performance is fantastic. And there's that moment where she discovers the fact that the boat's got a double layer of armor you know yep. and it's unsinkable well that wouldn't make a boat unsinkable it, it just it, that's not you know it, it just isn't like that you know um the reason why they had to steal the boats and not sink them in the harbor apart from the fact they didn't want to sink them because it leaves more of a signature as british operation but actually the reason was because the harbor was too shallow so if you sunk the boats they'd just sit on the bottom they could refloat them yeah mm. So that idea that, you know, you've doubled the thickness of the armor, therefore you can't blow them up. Well, you can you just, you just, you know, in, increase the size of the charges. It, 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 you can blow anything up. You've got enough explosives. So it's kind of a bit of a non sequitur, but I think I think they get away with it. I, I, I don't I don't think I rubbed up against that in any stretch of the imagination. I, yeah, that's I great. Think, that's yeah, great. I, I think uh, from someone who's sort of seen both versions of the story, I, I think that flows perfectly well. I mean, one thing I, I did have questions about, and I think it was more just a case of... Um, because it's a film and it's it's a fun rollick a, a sort of a drama as i think unfortunately a lot of the other team of the the maid honor apart from Lassen and the march phillips do kind of take a bit of a because i think there was yeah there's definitely a few of the the old favorites in there too uh to talk a bit, a bit of a back seat to the rest of it because it is really henry cavill and alan richardson's film i i, I think it is a shame you don't see as much of them because if there are sequels you will be seeing a lot more of them, and I mean, people can read up on what happened to some of the perhaps March Phillips in 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 the in the future. I don't know what you'd be doing with that character, but you'd be seeing a lot more of the other soldiers on the boat. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, Appleyard, for example, I agree. I, That's it. I think he sits a bit in the background, and you know, Appleyard, and, and as the book amply demonstrates, you know, becomes a seminal figure. In that raiding unit, I mean, he, him and Lassen are, you know, they're absolute partners in crime. So, so yeah, I mean, you've got to bring those other characters more alive. And 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 and, and yes, it's 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 led very much by Henry Cavill as Gus March Phillips and Alan Richon as as Lassen, and they they are such compelling characters that um, you know they kind of o- almost overshadow the rest of the cast. But you know. Um, Isa, in my view as well, also manages to pull herself out of their shadow and become a, you know, become a glittering star of the movie. I think she's a, she's fantastic. So, you know, um, hopefully there'll be more of her to come in the future as well. For sure. I, I, I think the reality was that person she's based on does marry Gus March Phillips. Yeah. It did marry, I should say. Yeah. yeah. So there is still more to come there. And I suppose then, holistically looking back on the, the, the film, 
a few months ago now it's just come to streaming on prime video as well uh so more people will be checking it out hopefully because the, the releasing of this film has been a bit interesting because of guy Ritchie's uh, uh contract with amazon and how his distribution works so some of the world haven't quite seen it yet so i'm glad more eyes will finally get to see the ministry of ungentlemanly warfare but for you you've been with this story for nigh on a decade it's now been brought to life on the big screen. How do you feel about it? Do you feel like it was it was done well? And are you happy with the finished product? Yeah. So um, I, when I first saw it in the movie theatre, Chad Oman, the producer, said, "I'm re- I, actually <laughs> we'd never met before. We'd been on Zoom loads of times. He's he's in the states. I'm here. So we yeah. met in London for the first time. And I said, Chad, you look really, you look really unwell. I mean, you look like you know you don't look happy. And he said, oh, well, I'm, You're not going to like the movie. And I was like, Really? He's like, yeah. I said, well, no, no, we went and watched it. And I came and said, Chad, look, it's, it, it's pretty damn good. I said, let, let me go away and, you know, digest it. But yeah, I'm, I, I kind of, and when I heard all the people say at the end, you know, gosh, it's based on a true story. And, and they were just blown away. That kind of, that kind of did it for me. And then I was sent a copy and I sat down um, at home with my, you know, with my kids and my wife. And I've got a 15 year old daughter, a 19 year old son and 21 year old son. Okay. And we sat down to watch it. And the point about it is this is when it kind of like really hit home for me. They all loved it. They didn't love it because it was dad's book. You know, they just loved it as a movie. So to turn a World War II story about, you know, black operations into into a piece of rollicking great family viewing that everyone mm-hmm. could enjoy, that's a hell of an achievement. And then the next weekend, I think it was the next weekend or the weekend after we sat down to choose a movie, and my daughter, who's 15, chose The Imitation Game, you know, the Bletchley Park yep. story. So that's what it did for her well you know look if 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 if, if the minister and gentlemanly warfare can take this story to you know far wider audience millions you know and get more people to read the book or or just look into this part you know this era of world war ii and more debt that's fantastic and you know look not to kind of bring a downer at the end but you know i think it's worth saying that you know we live in a very insecure world mm-hmm. there, are, there are things going on at the moment that should worry us all democracy is under assault um, you know, we've seen it in Ukraine. We've seen it in France with Le Pen, you know, almost winning. You know, democracy is under attack. And, you know, we seem to forget the lessons of history so easily. These people paid the ultimate price for our freedom and, and you know, that we enjoy today. Uh, you know, I, I was a war reporter. I've been to bad places. Mm-hmm. I know what places are like where you do not have democratic freedoms and they are not nice. So I know what it's like, but most people don't. So if we can just remind people by, you know, things like this movie, that this is what people gave the ultimate sacrifice for and again i don't always bring people down at the end of the show but it's it's true no. every single person in that movie was dead by the end of the war all the team died not one of them survived they all gave the ultimate sacrifice so the fact that they volunteered for hazardous duties knowing they were going into these suicidal missions well actually none of them actually survived the war I think what I believe it was your daughter you said uh, kind of rings true and, and and does give me a little bit of hope there that you know she saw this and then thought there's more here let's go and explore yep. and if this is the foot in the door for people to learn a little bit more about history and maybe learn a few lessons along the way maybe that will change and and shape voters yep. and consciousnesses and minds of the future and that's I mean, the old saying is, if you don't live from history, you're doomed to repeat it. That's that's yep. never ring true other than now. And I won't get too on my soapbox myself. I, I easily couldn't have in the past. Um, but I completely agree with you. Let's yep. put it that way. A couple of questions left for you to wrap us up. Um, you've mentioned seeing this as more, potentially. There are far more operations in the book to talk about. And there's far more years left of the war. Uh, where we leave off our, our our ministry of ungentlemanly warfare at the end of the film, what do you see as the next mission they're going to go on potentially, and what are the chances of getting the next film? Have you heard anything from Richie and the team? What, how's that looking? So when I uh, met the guys on set, the other thing that um, Alan Richardson said to me, and it was really edifying actually, um, and I, I didn't prompt it at all. He just said it, you know, off the cuff. He said, "You know something?" He said. Let me tell you about the mission I'm really looking forward to playing next. He said, you know, the raid on Heraklion, where Lassen has to go onto the German airbase three mm-hmm. times to 
get all the aircraft he possibly can. And he's yelling out orders in German because he's fluent in German to confuse the enemy. He said, it's just like nothing else on earth. I am so looking forward to playing Anders Lassen in, in, you know, in that scene. So I would imagine that's the, and it's got the right elements because Heraklion, why was Heraklion such a key raid? Because Malta was about to fall mm -hmm. and, 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 and Hitler had basically, if Malta falls, we win the Mediterranean. And mm -hmm. Churchill has said, if Malta falls, the enemy win the Mediterranean. It was absolutely pivotal. And the only way to stop Malta falling was to get the convoys through. And the only way to get the convoys through was to make sure the German aircraft stayed on the ground because they were blown to smithereens. So it's got the same kind of stakes as as a Fernando Po mission. And it's equally extraordinary and um, unbelievable in terms of what they do there. So, yeah, I, that that's where they will go next, I would imagine. And in terms of, you know, where it's at, well, I mean, I think uh, Jerry Bruckheim has been, you know, uh, on on uh, the media talking about it, talking about you know doing the sequel. So I I hope it's going to happen, and I, I I'd be disappointed if it doesn't. I mean, they've got a brilliant brilliant cast to, you know, bring back for more missions, and they've got a great uh, set of characters in terms of what they go on to do for the rest of the war. So yeah, you know, fingers crossed. I think Heraklion is, is is a great way to do the next one. It's got a bigger scale. I mean, the whole airfield and a lot of incursions and a big mission to get there in the first place, sort of the yeah. Odyssey in a sense. You're going all the way behind enemy lines. Yeah. You've, got, you've got a lot going on there. I think that's a great choice. And I would love to see that. And I'd love to see um, yeah, Richardson come back and, and do that role and flesh out the rest of the team a bit more as well. I think yeah. that'd be great to see the rest of the boys. Um, now, I, I, I feel a bit bad in a way because you've done more than one book. You've done many books. And I'm going to put some links in the show notes below. People can go to your website and find out more about what you've written. But second to last question is, what are you working on currently, Damien? What have you got coming up? So I'm working on a uh, book about um, uh, really Paddy Main, um, Colonel Blair Paddy Main, who was the commander of the SS for most of the war after David Sterling was captured. And it's his operations in... Um, France and Germany, so 44 and 45. So it's, it's you know, post D-Day operations, then the march into Germany. And actually the SS go on to be the first to liberate Belsen concentration camp. So it ends up in a pretty dark place. Mm. Hell of a story, um, immensely compelling. Um, my um, book about Josephine Baker, who was the black female, you know, superstar before the war, who then became the absolute amazing superstar, super spy for the Allies. So as in Josephine, as it was, as it's called in the States, or it was called the Flame of Resistance here, that's supposedly being made into a streaming series, and Janelle Monet is attached to play Josephine, which would be amazing. Oh wow, be, she's great. She would be a fantastic, perfect fit. Mm -hmm. um, and there's various other, you know, um, books uh, in various stages of movie and streaming adaptation. Um, and I, I'm, I, I've got, you know, books that I'm under contract to write until 2027. So I am going to be busy for a while. But yeah, uh, you know. It's not a job. What I do is a vacation. I'm extremely lucky, and um, you know, I, I love every day that I'm I'm here at the keyboard writing. Uh, well, I've I've loved everything that I've I've read so far. I would urge people to go and check out the book, The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, and check out the film. Now it's on streaming Prime Video. I think mostly worldwide by the sounds of it. So if you haven't seen it in theaters originally, check it out definitely. The last question, Damien, I have for you, and this has been asked to every single person that's ever been on the show. So I'd be remiss if I didn't. We talk about spy movies here every week. I need to know, Damien Lewis, what is your favourite spy movie of all time? My favourite spy movie of all time? God, I'd probably have to say Casablanca, but that's probably been said a million times before. It's Surprisingly a... not, actually. It's not, a, really? it's not a frequent choice. No. Really? No. It, it, you, one of a handful. It's such a you know, it's, it's just such a classic. And I've actually written about Casablanca at that time in one of the books I've written about so I, I kind of came back to and watched it several times over whilst i was doing that so yeah it, it just is yeah one of the best it yeah it's i we haven't actually tackled it yet on the show but i can tell people ahead of time it's one of my personal favorites so yeah i i'm with you there uh, i i can't fault that choice wonderful casablanca damien lewis i absolutely love it and i've loved talking to you about ministry of ungentlemanly warfare available on prime video now damien it's been an absolute pleasure yeah thank you very much take care of yourself i'll speak to you soon Thank you. Cheers. There you go, folks. That was our chat with Mr. Damien Lewis. I want to thank Damien once again for sitting down with us. And I want to thank you all for listening. We hope you've enjoyed our deep dive into the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. It's certainly an interesting film. 
Uh, I'm glad it's now uh, on Amazon Prime for people to check out around the world and see what sort of spy jinx Guy Ritchie, Henry Cavill, Isaac Gonzalez and Alan Richardson can get up to. Uh, but that wraps us up for ministry. But moving on next week, what can you expect? We will be taking a look at 2015's Hitman, Agent 47, the follow-up to the Timothy Oliphant Hitman film that came out a few years before. Uh, we've got a really fun episode on the film and, and a great interview coming later next week as well. So your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to join us next week as we take a look at Hitman Agent 47. We hope you've enjoyed what you heard on this episode. If you did, please consider joining us over on our Patreon, patreon.com slash spyhards. Make sure, of course, you follow us discreetly on social media at spyhards. That's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S. But until next time, folks, you'll find me practicing my bow and arrow skills with Anders Lassen. <laughs>